You are listening to the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network with Pastor Peter J. Peters, made possible by the tithes and offerings of the faithful. If you would like to be one of those who help to get needed truths out to others, send your support to Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. That's Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And pay a visit to our website, www.scripturesforamerica.org. That's scripturesforamerica.org. At our website, we broadcast 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And remember, too, the live evening broadcast at our website with Pastor Peter Peters, Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern, 8 to 9 Central, 7 to 8 Mountain, and 6 to 7 Pacific. That program is live, controversial with guests and call-ins and taboo subjects not acceptable in mainstream media. That's at www. Dot .scripturesforamerica.org Should you go there on Sunday mornings, 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time, you'll see and hear Pastor Peter's Sunday morning church service. And when you write, why not ask for a free copy of the Scriptures for America Dragon Slayer Newsletter Magazine. Again, our address is Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And now, back to our program. The much-needed and life-changing messages to be heard on this listener-supported Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network is listed by name at our website, sfawbn.com. Visit sfawbn.com as all of this network's scheduled messages and times are posted there. The messages are also archived at the website. The network presents truths heard nowhere else. The next message of truth by Pastor Peters, direct from his radio ranch, will help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to keep broadcasting him on this network by sending support to Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Website, sfawbn.com. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, there is no solution until we understand what we are trying to get across in Bible study number one and number two. In the last hour, you heard part one of a simple Bible story, a simple Bible study. In this hour, you're going to hear part two. We hope and pray it will be a blessing to your life. It's a message that I brought from my church pulpit some time back and was sent out on our Scriptures for America tape ministry. Here it is, and we'll be back at the end of this message. This will be a lesson, part two. I suppose a simple study on the Anglo-Israel truth. And I have to say that the reason I brought part one last Sunday is because I came here and I was tired wasn't feeling the greatest and I had nothing to bring anyway and I brought a lesson that I could give with my eyes closed but it's something that's taken years to to gather together and it was the leading of God I felt very invigorated after last Sunday because we had so many for us anyway visitors that were here and this was new and exciting information in fact there was one young man a college boy said he's going to come back this Sunday he was excited about it, wanted some material sent to him. And there were uh, four other people right over here. But I want you to notice something. They're not here today. <laughs> and I had promised that today we're going to find America in the Bible. Now, to me, that's exciting. Then I was thinking this week. You know, I brought a message down at the university there in Denver. I forget the name of the university. And we put it out on the tape ministry, and people said it was one of the best basic uh, Anglo-Israel messages put together in one package of a C60 tape that they'd ever heard. In fact, we played it on the air and people have been excited about it. How many remember that message? But I thought to myself this week, you know, there was not one person in that audience that came to me for more information. Not one of them contacted me on the email that they could have contacted me on. Not one of them came to church afterwards. The truth of the matter is we're living in a time when truth really isn't that important. Yeah, right. 
We feel good and our little lies are all about us. Just don't rock the boat. So, it is today the same as it has been in the past. The remnant. The ones that God has given ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to care for the truth. I want to give some review from last week. One place I want us to go is Deuteronomy chapter 14. I want to ask you, can you accept this passage? Deuteronomy chapter 14. And the verse we're going to look at there is verse 2. Quote, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. End of quote. Can you accept that? Can you believe that? Let's read it again. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of this earth. Now let me tell you, the world can accept that if we define the people as the people called Jews today. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, God has chosen of all the people on the face of this earth, the Jew. We must bless the Jew so God will bless us. If we do curse the Jew, God will curse us. Israel over there is the apple of his eye. We must support. Now, that is, this verse is acceptable in light of that. Yeah. Or, yes, we can accept Deuteronomy 14.2 if we just accept the fact that today his people are spiritual Israel, the church. And they are chosen of all the people on the face of this earth above everyone else. And we have no problem accepting that. But if we stop and look at Deuteronomy 14.2, at that time when he was speaking, who was he speaking to? A physical flesh and blood people. Was he not? Amen. Can you get around it? Was he speaking to a race of people? Yeah, he was. And so what I tried to do in the last message was to give you an overview of what took place in the Old Testament with these people. It's quite a story. It's a story of intrigue. It's a story of betrayal. It's a story of, uh, of a rocky marriage, if you will. But it's a story where God is keeping his word. Now, his word in way of review was to Abram in Deuteronomy chapter, excuse me, Genesis chapter 12, that his seed was going to become a great nation. And then we went to Genesis chapter 17. God said, Abram, change your name. New deal. We're going to expound on the old deal. We're going to change your name to Abraham. And not only is your seed going to become a great nation, it's going to become a multitude of nations. And this covenant I'm making with you now, Abe, is not only going to be between you and me, boy, but it's going to be between me and you and your descendants after you for an everlasting covenant. Now, at that time, they were flesh and blood people. And it seems like because we have been conditioned by the lies, and we love the lies. By the way, regarding lies, I want to warn you about something. Have you turn to Revelation, the last chapter. Now, you can take it or leave it. But I'm telling you, this is the way it is. In Revelation... Chapter 22, verse 15, it says, Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Our nation today is full of people that love the lie, yeah. makes them feel good, and whispers some more sweet nothings in my ear. I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of people today, they are absolutely turned off from the truth that there could be a race of people who have formed a multitude of nations, who have in the last days formed a great nation called America, meaning heavenly kingdom. They're turned off from that. They don't want to hear that because that doesn't make them feel good. Well, that's the truth. And I am not backing off from it. Once I found this, this was a, 
a gem, a jewel. It's, it's exciting. I don't understand why those people are, haven't been calling me up this week, let alone not be back in church. Yeah. It's no big deal to them. The suffering and the terror that is going on today, get this, is based upon the big lie that the churches love to hear. The Jews are God's chosen people. The attack in New York was not against America. It was against two Jewish towers. That's what it was against. And there is a part of the world saying, Wake up, America. The Arab world understands that people called Jews today are not the Israel people of the Scripture. If we would understand the promise that God made that the seed of Abraham was to form a multitude of nations, then we know that the Jews can't fit that, the people called Jews today. Because they've never formed a multitude of nations. Never have. Well, don't despise your birthright like Esau did. Because it might make you different than the rest of the world. Oh, it's so scary because people might look at me as a racist. What difference does it make what the world looks at you as? We left off with, here's the overview of the story. God made the covenant with Abram. He expanded the covenant and changed his name to Abraham. That covenant extended to his son Isaac. Isaac's sons is where it appears that we get the term Saxons. Isaac's covenant passed on to Jacob and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob Israel had 12 sons and they formed the 12 tribes of Israel. God keeping his word they formed a nation. Their first king was Saul, the second king was David, the next king was Rehoboam and at that time, excuse me there was Saul and David and Solomon and then Rehoboam and when Rehoboam took the throne there was a division and they formed two nations. Very important to understand this. The house of Israel the house of Judah. The house of Israel went into Assyrian captivity about 700 years before Christ. And we hear very little more about them in the Bible. But what happened to them? Well, we know, contrary to what is taught in the churches today, they did not go out of existence because we are told in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, that we looked at in the first message, that they were going to form a multitude like the sand of the sea. And that someday they would join together with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And they would have one leader. What happened to those people? Briefly, let me tell you. They dispersed to the north and to the west, into the areas of Europe and the British Isles. And they became nations. Cut off from God. They were not his people. They had been divorced. That's what happened to them. Now, to say that they weren't around is to deny... James chapter 1. Let's go there. 700 years later, thereabouts, James is writing, and this is what he says in James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Now, I've told you this illustration. I'll tell it to you again because there'll be people that might hear this message on radio or on the tape ministry that have not heard it. But when I was in my James class in Bible college, we started out with this verse, and I remember my professor saying that the 12 tribes dispersed abroad was the church. That's the teaching that the church is spiritual Israel. You see? And I raised my hand that day, and I said, but it doesn't say church. It says the 12 tribes. Well... They were in existence then, and they were shed abroad. Now, that word, dispersed abroad, let's look at it. That word, dispersed abroad, is a word that's used only three times in the New Testament. You might want to write this down or make a mental note of it. Here is James 1.1, 1, 1, one time. The other time is 1 Peter. And since we're close there, let's go over to 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 1 again. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethania, who are chosen. What's 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 saying? It's not that hard to understand. He's writing to a chosen people who are scattered or dispersed in a certain area. There's the word again. 
The other place it's used in, is in the Gospel of John chapter 7. Let's go there. John chapter 7, verse 35. I'm reading from the New American Standard, and it says, The Jews therefore said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we should, find, should not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? And there's the same word. It's the Greek word dysporia, I think it is. But this is what it means. It means Israel in other countries. According to Strong's, according to Holman's, Israelites living abroad. That's what the word means. This word used three times. John 7, 35, James 1, 1, and 1 Peter 1, 1. It means Israelites scattered abroad. Meaning this, that when Jesus spoke here, they knew about this dispersion that took place 700 years before Christ. The ten tribes of Israel being cast off. Why shouldn't they know it? knew it. They had, the, they had the, the, the prophets. They had the promises. So, who were the Gentiles? Turn over to Romans chapter 9. And who were the Jews? Well, let me finish the thing on Gentiles. In Romans chapter 9, it's harder to catch if you have the King James, but you can find it. It's easier in the New American Standard. Starting with verse 23, And he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he preached, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he also called, not among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Now, in the last message, I pointed out that Hebrews 8.8 8 teaches clearly that the new covenant was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, Paul is talking about those people that have been called. He said he called us from the Jews, did it not say that? And from the Gentiles. And I said in the last message that one of the problems that exists is that we have the wrong definition of, Jew, of Gentile in our head. We think the word Gentile means non-Jew. All one has to do is look up the Greek word for Gentile, which is ethnos, and this is what it says, quote, a race, a nation, plural, the nations. The word Gentile means nation. A nation. God said to Abraham that his seed was going to form a multitude of what? Nations. Nations. Now, I want, to, I want to drive it home again. We're talking about flesh and blood race of people forming what? Nations. The word Gentile means nations. Now, what nations is he talking about? You have to look at the context. Let's look at the context. In verse 24, Even us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, the King James says, O.C. I don't know why. And then notice he then quotes Hosea. He is quoting Hosea chapter 1 and 2. Quote, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall, come, it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you, shall not, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. This is so significant. So, Pastor Peters, are you saying that we are saved by race? No. We are saved by grace. Well, are you saying that all those people, just because they were born of a certain race, they are saved? No. Let's read on. Just read the scriptures. Verse 23. Or verse 27, rather. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. 
Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. You know, those were Israelites that were here. They're not here today. Because they're not the remnant. They just don't have ears to hear and eyes to see. Makes no difference to them. No big deal. I don't understand it. They don't understand me. They don't see the big deal that I make. But to me, it's like someone says, Hey, they knock on your door. Knock, 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 knock. Man answers, Hi. He's carrying a briefcase. I've got good news for you. You are the inheritor of a great fortune. And you, because of who you are, have been left a great fortune and legacy. Oh, really? I'm not interested. Slam the door. That's really what we're dealing with. That's really what it comes down to. So it's just the remnant. But the point I want you to see is that the Gentiles that were accepting the gospel in the New Testament was those people that Hosea spoke about. And Romans 9, 24, 25, and 26 prove that point. Are there any questions up to this point by anybody? So let's go to this thing about the Jew then. Remember, I told you there was the house of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and the house of Judah, the two southern tribes. The people from the house of Judah were called Judeans. And it is translated in your Bible, Jews. Okay? Now I want to ask you something. What are people in Texas called? They are called Texans. Well, what are what were the Texans in 1840? Or let's just say, what were the Texans in 1890? Well, they were predominantly, somebody at that time could have said, well, they're the Anglo people down there. Because that's what Texas was. There were very few Mexicans in Texas at that time. But if you said today, what comprises Texans? It can be Anglos. It can be Mexicans. It can be... Arabs, it can be a Japanese, you see, it can be black people. Now, I want you to understand something about Judea. We're talking about Texas, which changed very much as far as the racial constituency in just a very few short years. Imagine the change in a few hundred years that took place in Judea. Now, when the house of Israel was taken into Assyrian captivity, the house of Judah remained. We looked in the last message at the passage in Jeremiah chapter 3 where God said, I divorced the house of Israel. I should have divorced Judah too, but I didn't. She became worse than the house of Israel. But God did not divorce Judah. But Judah became so bad, the house of Judah, that she was taken into Babylonian captivity. Now, we're talking about a big upheaval in the land. And we're talking about a land of milk and honey, as it was once called. It's a lot different than today. It was a very good land. Now, I want to tell you something about land. It does not remain vacant. When the house of, Israel, of Judah was taken into Babylonian captivity, did the land remain vacant? No. I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture, because I want to explain to you the word Jew. Go to Ezekiel, chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 24. Quote, Therefore I shall bring the worst of the nations, and they will possess the houses. I shall also make the pride of the strong ones cease, and their holy places will be profaned. Now what is the context here? Here's the context. Judah baby, you're going to go to the woodshed and get a spanking. I'm sending you to Babylon. And they were uprooted out of the land. And they were taken to a Babylonian captivity. But in the meantime, in those 70 years, what happened to the land according to the passage we just read here in Ezekiel chapter 7? It says the worst, the worst of the nations. And let's stop there a second. That isn't even very politically correct today. By the way, when you look at this word nation, we're talking about people. We're talking about a race. Yeah. And the reason it's not acceptable is because no race gets to be better or worse. And today, we're all the same. 
<laughs> That's the rule. Yeah. Well, God said, I'm going to take the worst nation I know of and I'm going to put them in the land. That's what he said. Do you love the truth? Or does the lie make you feel better? Well, who was the worst nation? I think it was Esau Edom. The Edomites moved in. They are the people that God has described as a people devoted for his wrath. Read Obadiah. He said, he said, you know, Jacob I love. He said, Amalekai, Esau I hate. And so what happened as Charles Wiseman very aptly points out in the book, Who is Esau Edom? Is many Edomites moved into the area. Seventy years later, we have a return from Babylonian captivity of the Israelites. And when you read about the book of Esther and Nehemiah, excuse me, of, of Nehemiah and uh, Ezra, you're reading about the Israelites coming back into the same land. Now it's like we're coming back to Texas, but Texas isn't the same place it was in 1890. If you don't believe that, just go down to El Paso. Okay. Well, now they're coming back to the land 70 years later. And it's not the same place. The worst of the nations have moved in. And that's why you read about how they had to rebuild the temple and the city walls with swords at their sides because there were people fighting against them and not wanting them to worship their God. Will the giant Goliath was taken down by David who took him on and you're listening to the network taking on the giant networks with truth in the name of Jesus Christ. This is your kind of network because it's your network because you sponsor it. This is a saint-sponsored network, sponsored by your tithes and offerings. Send support to Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network, P.O. Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535. Network website is sfawbn.com. Go there for the daily and weekly broadcasting schedule. See all the exciting speakers, programs, sermon titles, and events scheduled today and this week. We've got music, health programs, coffee with Pastor Peter's Radio Ranch Wranglers, science programs, guest speakers, Bible study prayer, news, and more for you. Pray for this gigantic and costly effort to take on the giants and help us to continue to broadcast on satellite, radio, internet, shortwave, and there's even Internet Web TV where you can attend live to the Laporte Church of Christ with Pastor Peters. Send support to Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Website, sfawbn.com. Now, now we move on in history. Over the centuries, things happen. And as Charles Wiseman points out, one of the things that happened is John Hyrcanus came in and conquered the Edomites and forced them to become followers of what we now begin to see as Judaism. So they became followers of Judaism. I'm just giving you a background. So when you read the word in the New Testament, Jew, you are reading about Judean. The people living in Judea. You don't know unless you can see from the context of who they are. Well, Pastor Peters, I don't even know who I am. You know, how many of us know our genealogical background? I don't know about you, but I don't. But I want you to know something about your background. Turn over to the book of John chapter 10 and read with me verse 27 my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me does anybody know hear much about sheep herding well a sheep herder the sheep that he shepherds knows his voice the shepherds could get together and put all their sheep in a big sheep pen at night and in the morning, the shepherd will get up and call for his sheep, and his sheep will hear his voice, and his sheep will come out of that flock and follow him. How many knew that about sheep? Did you know that, Jim? It's different cattle, isn't it? Well, that is the way it was with sheep. So here's the point I'm making. 
If you have heard the voice of Jesus Christ and you have been baptized for the remission of sins and you are bearing the Christian fruits that you're supposed to, love, joy, peace, happiness, then my sheep hear my voice and follow me. You are one of his sheep. Aren't you happy about that? So, I'm talking to you as a group of people that are of the same ethnic and racial makeup. Well, what about people that aren't of that ethnic and racial makeup? That's another part of this whole story. But from what I see in the story, Jesus went and purchased the world, that is the field, in order to redeem the treasure. Yeah. And so the door was open to others. Yeah. But I want you to know something. As God sent prophets to certain people, I as a minister have a calling, and my calling is to my people. That's who I care about. You know, because nobody else really cares about them. And they're being destroyed. Now, his sheep hear his voice. The people that were called to follow Jesus, according to Romans 9, were called out of the Jews or Judeans. The Judeans that were his people, for the most part, from what I can see in history, followed him and they came out. The Gentiles, the nations that were his people, they heard his voice and they came out. And what was happening? Hosea, I mean, yes, Hosea 1, 10 was being fulfilled. The house of Israel and the house of Judah were coming together under one leader. Now, when you understand this, the, take the story of the prodigal son. If you really look at that, it really has a deeper meaning than what we realize. There was a father and he had two sons. Who were they? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. And when the prodigal son came back, the son that had stayed with the father became jealous, remember? He didn't really receive him that well. And that was happening in the days of the New Testament because the people that were of the Jews, Judeans, they saw these heathens coming in, which were the Gentiles, and there became a conflict. And that's what the story of the prodigal son is about. Now, in the story, what I want you to see here is then that the people that were his people of the Jews heard his voice and they followed him. About Jew, it's something entirely different. Uh, and let me point something out to you. I brought this here because I thought maybe some of the visitors would come back and obviously I thought wrong. But this is the Jewish almanac. It's, uh, I think it's the 1980 uh, Jewish almanac. Yes, it is. And I want to read to you here. Part 1, the Jews, Identity Crisis, a brief history for the term Jew. Now listen as I read. Quote, Strictly speaking, it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew or to call a contemporary Jew an Israelite or a Hebrew. End quote. That's quite an admission. It means something. For those who are interested in truth. For those who are not. So, and do nothing to me. Let's try to get to America at this stage. It is no accident that predominantly, and I know this isn't kosher, it isn't politically correct to say, but it is no accident that predominantly, predominantly, Christianity is a white man's religion. Particularly if you take out Catholicism, which isn't Christianity at all. It's been because his sheep hear my voice. Now, it's been these people, in the last message, we pointed out that God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless the world through your seed. It's been the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's translated the Bible into every language and dialect there is. It's been these people that have made up the missionaries that have taken the gospel to all the other worlds. Why? Because God said, that's the way I'm going to bless the world. It doesn't mean he doesn't love other people. And the illustration I used last week, as I said to Steve McDonald, uh, uh, I hope I didn't offend him, but I said, here's my wife. 
And I love her. I chose her as my wife over all the many women that would throw themselves at me. <laughs> no, that's, that's a little stretching it. <laughs> but the point is, I chose her as my wife. I love her. Now, I love Steve's wife, too, as a Christian sister. But I hope I don't offend you, Steve, by telling you I love my wife more than your life. wife. It's different. You see what I'm saying? Israel was his bride. It didn't mean that he didn't love the other people, but they were chosen. That's, that, does that make sense? Yes. Now, let's go over to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. And uh, I'll, next 10 minutes, try to bring America in here for where you can see it. Because the things that are going on in America today all tie to this, to this story of God calling Abraham. I still have difficulty at times understanding why people can't get excited about this. It says, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10, quote, I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Have you ever read this passage in the Septuagint? Look it up, would you? And I'd like to know what it says. But here's what I want you to see what the light and the glory says about this. Now, the light and the glory is a pretty good history of America and the colonial, uh, the forming of America up through the colonial times and the Revolutionary War. It's written by, obviously, a Judeo-Christian Baal priest. But he's done a tremendous job, or they have, there's two of them, in researching some things. And I want to read to you from this book on page 157. Quote, By now a farewell sermon had become a tradition. And now we're talking about 1629, by the way. By now a farewell sermon had become a tra uh, tradition, and it was preached by a stalwart young Puritan minister named John Cotton, whose star was also destined to rise over New England. He preached on 2 Samuel 7.10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Go forth, Cotton exclaimed, exhorted, with a public spirit, uh, with a public spirit, with that care of universal ha helpfulness. Have a tender care to your children that they do not degenerate as the Israelites did. Samuel L. Morrison put it thus, Cotton's sermon was of a nature to inspire these new children of Israel with the belief that they were the Lord's chosen people, destined that they kept the covenant with him to people and fructify this new Canaan in the western wilderness. In the quote. Now, I think it's significant that the farewell sermon given to the pilgrims as they were leaving to America, was taken from this text, 2 Samuel 7.10. Do you find that significant? Yeah. They recognized that God was picking them up and placing them in the land that God had prophesied through the prophet Nathan, clear back in the days of King David, uh -huh. that he was going to have a special place for them. Now, rapidly, let's try to find America in the scripture. Turn over to Micah chapter 4. This is a prophecy as is well seen in verse 1 about the last days and about a nation. In Bible prophecy mountain means nation. And this is what it says Micah chapter 4 verse 1 And I will and it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it and many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for, uh, men, for mighty distant nations. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. 
and each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make him afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Though all the people walk each in the name of his God, as for me, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. Now, I'm going to stop here a second. Now, there is a one part of this passage that I have trouble making it harmonize. But the rest of it, it all fits. And it came about in the last days. This mountain became greater than all the others. And they would come from the other mountains. Many people would come. The national emblem on America, uh, the statement on America's emblem, uh, national emblem, is the pluribus unum. Meaning what? Out of many, one. Out of, m how did she form? Out of many white nations, the greatest mass migration of people ever in the history of mankind, the Scots, the English, the Germans, the French, the Swedes, the Norwegians, they were all the same genetic base, if you will, came to America. We have a free gift to give you of tremendous value, a gift that can change your life and open your eyes to the insight of world events and the present happenings in America. Listen on. You're listening to the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network, heard worldwide 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on satellite, at the website www.scripturesforamerica.org, and on radio. This tremendous outreach is made possible by the prayers and financial support of the faithful. If this includes you, we would like to send you this special gift of a 90-minute DVD entitled Roots, From Abraham to America. It's a part trailblazing TV program with Pastor Peters and fearless fame historian and archaeologist E. Raymond Capp, bringing history and a key to the kingdom truth that is purposely and maliciously being kept from you and your children. Truths concerning the biblical roots of the white people who settled America. In the 1960s, the question asked by a troubled generation of Caucasian children was, Who am I? This DVD gives the answer, backed with proofs, archaeological evidence, and maps you can get nowhere else. Get this free gift by writing to Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535. Ask for the Roots DVD. It's our way of saying thank you to those of you who support this Scriptures for America worldwide broadcasting network. Get it while you can, this free, life-changing, eye-opening, mystery-solving DVD, Roots, From Abraham to America. You have nothing to lose and only truth to gain. Now, they walked in the name of God. When they came to America, they came in the name of God. If you read their history, they looked to the Word of God. There was a time in America, believe this or not, you could not hold public office if you, did not believe, if you were not white and if you were not a believer in Jesus Christ and you did not believe in the Bible. How many knew that? That's the way it was once in America. You, you, you can be sure in America's public government dumbed down schools today, they've never heard that. But that's in Charles Wisen's book, Free, White, and Christian, which is just taking the charters of the early colonies and reading the requirements. Now, it says in verse 6, In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcast, even those whom I have afflicted. So he's saying that this nation is going to be gathered with outcasts. I want to read from this book, The Light and the Glory. Listen to this. Quote, Clearly, God had moved to save Virginia when men had abandoned her. And though more ministers were beginning to draw the analogy of a new promised land, none had quite the timidity to suggest that the mixed band of convicts, down-at-the-heels gentlemen, Professional soldiers without a war and slum orphans for the city fathers of London had hit upon a unique solution for doing something about the swarming bands of street urchins were a new chosen people. What's he saying here? How could these people who were basically the outcasts of the old world be forming a new people? That's exactly what it says here in verse 6. I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I will afflict it. And I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong what? Nation. So we're talking about a prophecy of a very great nation forming. And it says, And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. If you go to this book, The Light and the Glory, it says that 
back in 1776, it became the motto, if you will, the battle cry, the slogan up and down the colonies through the Committee of Correspondence, No King But Jesus. Now, can you imagine, here are the churches ignoring the fact that the greatest nation ever formed in all the history of mankind formed on the basis that they thought they were the covenant people of scripture, the Israelites, formed on the basis of the word of God, formed with the battle cry of no king but Jesus, and they tell us that America is not in the Bible. It is, and it's right here. Now it says, in verse 8, And as for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, this is an interesting passage. He said, even the former dominion. What does that mean? Well, I want to go to um, light in the glory here, and I want to read to you, at the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and by the way, I want to take a survey here, because when you preach as much as I do on the radio and travel around the country and on that type of thing, is this just old, is this old material to you kind of boring? Or is this interesting material? Be, be honest with me. Okay, so, all right, let me read then. Quote, In the silence that followed, the announcement of the vote, the late afternoon sun set, and we're talking about the vote for the Declaration of Independence. Okay? Now, get the setting in light of Micah 4, verse 8. The former dominion has come. I think this is significant. Quote, in the silence that followed the announcement of the vote, the late afternoon sun cast its soft rays through the tall windows on a brass candlestick standing on a green felt table covering. A carved eagle over the door, a pair of spectacles laying on a polished desk. The magnitude of what they had done began to weigh upon them, and they realized that they and their countrymen were no longer Englishmen, but citizens of a fledgling nation barely a few minutes old. Many stared out the window, some wept openly, some, like Witherspoon, bowed his head and closed his eyes in prayer. John Hancock broke the silence. Gentlemen, the price of my head has just been doubled. A wry chuckle followed, and then Samuel Adams arose. We have this day restored the sovereign to whom alone men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting sun, may his kingdom come. End quote. Now, do you see the significance of Samuel Adams' words in relation to this, that what I just read? They restore the dominion. And as you read on, the people at that time recognized the event as a prophetic religious happening. Listen. Quote, As the news of the Declaration spread abroad in the newborn nation, Americans everywhere were delirious with joy, cheering, waving, ringing church bells, wasting gunpowder. Samuel Adams wrote, The people, I am told, recognized the resolution as though it were a decree promulgated from heaven. End of quote. Now this is Micah chapter 4. The nation that God had promised way back there in 2 Samuel 7.10. Let's read what happens to her. Verse 8, And as for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished? that Agni has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth, for now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. America hasn't gone to hell. America's gone to Babylon. America gave up her king. He's called in scripture the mighty counselor. He said, where's your counsel now? But I want you to see something. We have birth pangs, but it says, There you will be rescued. There the Lord will what? Redeem you from the hand of your enemies. 
which is a whole nother message on baptism for the remission of sins where you are bought out of slavery by the blood of Christ, the Redeemer. That's the redemption process. Colossians said, when we are redeemed, in Colossians 1.13, we are translated out of the dominion of darkness, which is what? Babylon, into the kingdom. So, America is in the Bible. It's the new Jerusalem. Are there other passages of Scripture? Yes. Turn over to Zechariah chapter 1. And I realized that as I got started on this, just by happenstance, last Lord's Day, because I didn't have anything else to speak, that, you know, I could end up making this a long series of messages. But I really want to just wrap it up with, with this one. But in Zechariah chapter 2, what people don't understand is that there is in Scripture more than one J-E-R-U-S-A, L-E-M, Jerusalem. Now, isn't it interesting that USA is in the word Jerusalem? But the Scripture is clear there's more than one Jerusalem. The Baal priests have everybody looking over to this little bastard state in a dried up sandbox with a bunch of terrorists, literally terrorists, have formed that government. Now they, in this abandoned state, a parasite, a parasite to America, they exist off of a lie. And the reason men like this preacher is that ground zero, but I believe greater is he that is for me than he is against me, is because we are exposing a lie that funnels millions and billions of money to the Zionist movement. And so here we are saying, that's a lie. If that got out, do you realize what it would cost them in the old Jerusalem city that they're at right now? The New Jerusalem described in Zechariah chapter 2. Let's read about it. Verse 1. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him. And said to him, Run, speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. I'm going to stop there. Reading from the New American Standard, the word without walls has a number next to it. If you read the side note, it says, Like unwalled villages. So what is he saying there? First of all, Jerusalem is going to consist of unwalled cities, I think the King James says. Do you realize the significance of that? In the old world, the cities all have walls around them. This was unwalled cities. Because of the multitude, multitude of men, there's so many men, you've got to have all these cities. This is the Jerusalem of Scripture, and the cattle within it. Do you know that there are more cattle in Keith County, Nebraska, than there is in the entire state of the Israelis over there right now? That's just one county. I'm talking about a county in, in, in uh, what was called the Great American Desert, which our people came and allowed to bloom. See, all these prophecies that they try to point over there to this other land happen right here in this land. We made the desert bloom, you see. 1776, July 4th, a nation was born in, day, in one day. And it's all in keeping with prophecy. But let me read on. Verse 5, for, de for I declare the Lord will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Ho there, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Ho, Zion, escape you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory he has sent me against the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now, this is the new Jerusalem. Unwalled cities, full of a multitude of men, full of cattle. They say, oh, anybody that touches, touches the Jew over there touches the apple of his eye. Isn't that what we hear today? Yeah. We got the wrong land. We got the wrong people. Because we, got the, we don't have the story that I'm giving you here. And of course, if you go over to Ezekiel 38 and 39, 
It describes a people that come out. They had unwalled villages. They had great cattle. And the land was taken by the sword. Our people fought for this land. We fought the British. We fought the English. We fought the elements. And this land has gone into Babylon. So, summarizing it this way, God promised Abraham his seed would form a multitude of nations. They did. When they formed the first nation, that nation divided into two nations. The house of Israel was taken into Assyrian captivity 700 years before Christ. And over those many decades, they formed a multitude of nations. And when Jesus came and said, I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he was coming to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea 1, 10, and 11, where the house of Israel and the house of Judah would join together under one leader. And they joined under one leader. These people that came into the new covenant were called from the Jews, the Judeans, called from the Gentiles, the nations. The remnant are saved. They heard his voice. And... As time went on, they established a Christian nation. But it wasn't Christian very long. Because in keeping with prophecy, they went to Babylon. And so today, we are at that stage. We are those people. We are in that land. And great things are taking place. And you can't understand what's taking place. And you can't understand what to do until you get this whole story together. Any questions? I have one, but no one will be able to answer it. Why didn't those people come back? This is Why didn't any of those college students contact me? I'll tell you why. Because they don't have a love for the truth. They don't have a love for Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And they would rather believe a lie. And I'm going to I'm gonna warn all of you. There's not one here. There's not one here that shouldn't heed this warning. Don't you play around with the truth. I've seen it happen. Because the Bible is clear. If you will not receive a love of the truth, God will send you a deluding influence so that you might believe a lie. If you haven't done so already, we encourage you to send for our introductory packet. It contains our large catalog, a special discount coupon, a finely printed copy of the Congressional Law which declares the Bible to be the Word of God. It also contains a current copy of our newsletter and information on how to receive it and on how to subscribe to our tape ministry. You can receive all of this by writing to Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535 USA, and asking for our introductory packet. Your $2 offering U.S. funds would help cover a part of the cost of sending it to you. That is a $2 offering U.S. funds. Write to Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Thank you for your prayers and support. In the Gospel, according to Matthew chapter 10, we read, quote, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, end quote. When Jesus Christ spoke those words to his apostles, who did he mean by the lost sheep of the house of Israel? If you would like to receive four tapes every month with biblically sound preaching on this and other important subjects, write for information about our tape ministry. Write to Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Again, that's Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA, and ask about our tape ministry. It's been a real blessing in the lives of many, and we're grateful for the support of the faithful remnant who make this ministry possible. And that we are, and we want you to know that we need your support. Our mailing address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Perhaps the saddest, most heartbreaking question a child can ever ask is, who am I? Instinctively, 
The heart goes out to a child so confused, so hurting, so anguished, and yet that's exactly the question our youth have been crying out since the explosive 60s. Who am I? Hispanics look to Mexico, blacks to Mother Africa, and Asians to the East. Yet what about the sons and daughters of this country's founding fathers, all of them white Europeans? The ongoing decline of America coincides exactly with this. You are listening to the listener-supported Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network. Heard worldwide on satellite, internet, radio, and shortwave. What you just heard was another message with timeless truths from Pastor Peter's pulpit. Remember, these messages are archived at sfawbn.com and are also available in CD format for a donation of $5 or more from Scripture. Greetings, this is Pastor Peters, and you're listening.